And we are so happy today to have Dr. Cal Matsumoto speak to us. Um, we've been trying for a little bit of a while to get him here, so happy that your schedule would allow that, Cal. Um, he is director of the Center for Intestinal Care and Transplant at MGUH Transplant Institute. He specializes in the care, management, and organ transplantation of both adult and pediatric patients. He performs complex multivisceral abdominal organ transplantation, living and cadaveric donor liver transplantation, and complex liver and biliary tract surgery for both malignant and benign liver and pancreatic disease. He received his undergraduate degree from University of Virginia, his MD from the Medical College of Virginia, surgical residency at Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii, Abdominal Organ Transplant Fellowship at Mount Sinai, and he served as the Chief of Liver Transplantation at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He came to join us on the staff in 2004. He's authored over 75 peer-reviewed manuscripts and seven book chapters in liver and intestinal transplantation, and he serves as an active reviewer in over 20 medical and surgical journals. He's also a colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves and has served tours as a combat trauma surgeon in both the Iraq and Afghanistan theaters of operations. He's a graduate of the Army Airborne School and Army Ranger School and just learned that uh, he had a career in the, as a U.S. Army officer in West Germany um, before uh, his medical training. So we're so pleased he's going to talk to us about Intestinal Transplantation 101. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Robin, and thanks for the uh, invitation. Well, thanks uh, for the introduction, Robin, and really it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to present to the, um, the Medical Grand Rounds. I hope it's not a hostile crowd. So, uh, and, and as you mentioned, <laughs> I am a surgeon, so the, this, this um, presentation has a lot of pictures. <laughs> so, but uh, I'll talk about bowel transplant. It's a rare procedure, as you'll see from the numbers that I'll show you. And not a lot of people know that you can even do a bowel transplant. So hopefully, you know, the goals of this are to talk about um, the, um, uh, the indications for bowel transplant and talk about the different types of bowel transplant grafts there are, because it's not all, you know, just a bowel. Some have liver, stomachs, colons, pancreas, things like that. And then talk about outcome. I won't talk about post-operative care and complications. That, that really is like a 10-hour lecture in itself. So, so I'll focus on the indications, the different types of transplants that we do uh, that are called bowel transplants, and then I'll talk about some of the outcomes. So let's see. Um, so here's the, the outline that I'll do today. I'll talk really briefly about the history of bowel transplant, the definition of intestinal failure, the reasons why we do a bowel transplant or the indications, uh, talk about the different surgical procedures, worldwide activity, and talk about the outcome of bowel transplantation. So um, the history, um, uh, Alexis Carell, the, the Nobel laureate, the French surgeon, he was the first really to perform a bowel transplant. This is in a dog, hooked it up to the dog's neck uh, as an experiment to see if it worked. This is in 1902. Um, several decades later, the first human bowel transplant was performed at the University of Minnesota. And that was like an experimental end of life procedure. Uh, that patient that uh, did not live very long. The early results were very poor. Uh, multiple attempts were tried. The longest survivor was about uh, a little over two months back then. But really, you know, there was no real um, need to, to pursue any advances in bowel transplant in the 70s because TPN was introduced. And TPN was great. I mean, you didn't need a bowel transplant because you can get all your fluid electrolytes and nutrients from, from TPN, this new invention called TPN. Uh, but like anything else, you, know, you start to see complications of TPN uh, develop over the next decade. In the 80s, uh, with the, at the same time, cyclosporin came out. There was a, a, a better results with organ transplantation across the board. And so um, you know, because we started to see more complications of TPN, there was a more interest in pursuing research in bowel transplantation. Uh, Starzl in Pittsburgh uh, performed the first bowel transplant, uh, first multivisceral transplant, and that patient lived about six months, which wasn't bad back then. Uh, and Dr. Deltz in Kiel, Germany, was really the first uh, to perform a successful bowel transplant. And that was, in a, that was an isolated intestine in an adult, and that patient uh, lived for about four or five years. 
Um, the emergence of FK506 or Prograf or Tacrolimus, all the same thing, uh, in the 1990s sort of revolutionized transplant even further. And Pittsburgh uh, published a, a really nice, uh, uh, the initial large series of bowel transplants in 1993. And that showed promise with a 60% one-year survival. That was really excellent back then. Um, and, and now the survival at large centers uh, like ours really is, is over 90%. Uh, so you can see uh, we made a lot of progress uh, in bowel transplantation from the early days. Currently right now, there's 40, centimeter, uh, 40 cent centers that have performed at least one bowel transplant. So um, you know, a lot of centers perform two or three a year. Only three programs last year in the whole country uh, performed over 10 bowel transplants in the year. And only two programs were, only, were over 15. And, and, and one of those uh, is ours. Our program performed um, about 18 transplants last year. Uh, so again, you can see the, the number of centers has gotten much smaller that do bowel transplants. And you'll see because it's a very complex uh, procedure, it requires a lot of resources. So that's a brief history. Let's talk about intestinal failure. Um, first of all, the de definition of, of intestinal failure is uh, the gastrointestinal tract function, which is insufficient for body nutrients and fluid needs. Pretty generic, pretty simple. And that can be either from inadequate gut length, so you have short, short gut, or you can have all your bowel, but the bowel just doesn't work. And that's uh, what we call functional intestinal failure. Some examples of inadequate gut length are here. You can see there's a congenital deficiency such as intestinal atresia, acquired losses, mid-gut volvulus, gastroschisis, neck. You can, you can see these are mainly these, uh, these uh, disorders that occur in infants uh, and small babies. Trauma, Crohn's disease, surgical misadventures, things like that, mesenteric ischemia. A lot of these uh, are really in the adult population. So all these lead to, to short gut syndrome, which lead to intestinal failure. Uh, the functional intestinal failures are very different. Like I said, they're, they have all their bowel length, but the bowel just doesn't work. Those are the congenital mucosal diseases, such as microvillus inclusion disease, tuffing enteropathy. These are the secretory diarrheas, mainly seen in, in pediatrics. Intestinal motility disorders, such as long segment Hirschsprung's disease, which affects the stomach, the duodenum, uh, and the entire small bowel. Um, again, you have all your bowel, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And the visceral neuropathies and myopathies, or the pseudo obstructions, the, the, the motility disorders, those are the diseases that mainly are seen in uh, older kids and, and adults. So you can see these, this is the category of functional intestinal failure, but they both lead to intestinal failure. Uh, so what do you do when you have a patient with intestinal failure? Well, obviously you start them on TPN. That's the number one thing, it, that's a simple answer. Uh, and at the same time, you start what we call bowel rehabilitation, to see if you can get a TPN either off or weaned, uh, weaned completely off or weaned down. And that could be something as simple as dietary changes, uh, medications, there's new medications, hormonal therapy. Again, these are all separate lectures in and by itself, um, uh, anti-motility drugs, and also potential autologous reconstruction. You can actually do some surgical procedures to lengthen the bowel uh, if it's appropriate. So, so you kind of concentrate in this top box here uh, when you're first diagnosed with intestinal failure. And you don't really move to bowel transplantation until you start to get complications uh, of, of TPN, which I'll, which I'll talk about. And that really is, uh, leads up to the indications for bowel transplant. So what time uh, do you stop dealing with TPN and bowel rehabilitation and et cetera, et cetera, and move on to bowel transplant? And that really leads up to the indications for bowel transplant. And it's really uh, kind of broken down into three major categories up top here. Two of them are related to uh, complications of the central venous access. Uh, you have thrombosis. If you don't have any access for, for TPN because all your upper extremity and your groin lines are, uh, are, are clotted, then, then obviously you need a bowel transplant because you can't physically deliver the TPN. If you have multiple infections, which I'll talk about, uh, that's also an indication for bowel transplantation. But the most feared complication really is liver disease from, from TPN. Um, and if you develop, start to develop liver disease from TPN, then you should really immediately be referred for a bowel transplant because what you don't want to happen is that liver disease progresses and then now you need a bowel and a liver transplant. So uh, these are the major three uh, categories that we 
refer to when we talk about indications for bowel transplant. Some of the secondary indications are recurrent re uh, episodes of dehydration, where you're, you know, you get like three or four liters of fluid a day. I mean, that's just not good for your kidneys to get that bolus of fluid every every day. Um, you know, it goes up and down, and that could cause end stage uh, kidney dysfunction. So. So really, if, if someone has years and years of re recurrent episodes of dehydration, uh, hospitalizations, uh, electrolyte problems, then that we consider a indication for bowel transplant. The last category, really uh, inability to tolerate TPN, that's, that's really sort of a, a subjective uh, category. It's, it's kind of, um, uh, it, it depends on the, how the, if the patient is willing to undergo risk for bowel transplant, knowing that you know, the risk of dying is greater with a bowel transplant but they just can't tolerate TPN, their, their lifestyle, and, and they're willing to undergo that risk, then, then we would consider somebody uh, to, for a bowel transplant. But, but again, that requires a, a lot of counseling uh, for the patient to make sure they know what they're getting used to. And once I talk to a patient that demands a bowel transplant, I can usually talk them out if they don't have uh, complications of, of TPN. A lot of these are spelled out in um, the CMS um, uh, guidelines for indications for bowel transplant that was published about 20 years ago. So let's talk about uh, uh, the first indication that I mentioned, central venous access thrombosis. You can see here on the left is a normal internal jugulars, and you can see here on the right, uh, all the collaterals. There's no way you can get a central line into this patient. That's an example of that. Here's an example of, of the exotic line. This is a, a transhepatic line on a patient that had no access whatsoever in the groins or in the chest. This is where the IR folks come in. They do a great job. They basically put a needle into the liver they find the hepatic vein and they thread a catheter up into the heart, as you can see right here. I mean, this is a really dangerous line. You don't want to get to this point here. Uh, this is a shot, uh, interoperative picture of looking straight down into the abdomen of a patient. This is the vena cava uh, right here. This is the left renal vein, and you can see the vena cava below the renal vein is completely thrombosed, and that's from multiple groin catheters. So this patient had no access anywhere. Um, here's another example of a lumbar line. Uh, again, IR does a great job finding these lines. They basically poke a needle into the IVC from the patient's side <laughs> over here and put a central venous catheter uh, through the side into the IVC. I mean, that is a really dangerous and exotic line. So by CMS guidelines, uh, the indications for bowel transplant is really loss of happier access. So if you in infants, we count the two jugulars and two subclavians as four points of access. If you lose two of those, then you should be considered uh, for uh, evaluation for bowel transplant. For adults, we, we count the femoral veins as, as access sites. And if you lose three of, of those six sites, then we consider uh, an evaluation for transplant. So that's, that's it for the thrombosis. And that's the, the objective um, uh, indications that's spelled out by CMS. For catheter-related infections, uh, by CMS guidelines, it's recurrent catheter sepsis. If you have two or more hospitalizations in a year, uh, then uh, that's considered uh, something uh, of, a, of a bad predictor, and that uh, it also will trigger a uh, 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 that should trigger an evaluation for a bowel transplant. A single fungal line sepsis episode, that really is sort of a surrogate marker uh, for just bad bowel. I mean, if fungus is getting through your bowel into your bloodstream spontaneously. Uh, then we then we consider that bowel needs to come out, and you need to, to get a, uh, a, a, new, a, a new GI tract. Um, a single episode admission of sepsis with hemodynamic instability from a central uh, line infection. Again, these are CMS guidelines back in, in you know 20 years ago, so things have changed. But it's, it states that if you have a single episode where you're in the ICU uh, with sepsis um, on pressors, then that's an indication for consideration of, of a bowel transplant. So those are the first two categories. Uh, the third category, as I mentioned, is, is probably the most feared complication of TPN, and that's liver disease. Um, it's really unknown, despite all of our experience, what causes uh, uh, TPN liver disease. Is it something that's toxic in the TPN? Is it the lipids? Lipids always get blamed. Um, or is it a deficiency in something in the TPN? It's really unclear what cause is the actual cause of, of liver disease from TPN. What we do know, though, is that if you stop TPN, your liver disease will get better up to a certain point. If you know the four stages of fibrosis and liver uh, um, fibrosis, if you have stage one or stage two, 
Uh, generally, if you stop TPN, that insult, um, the liver will get better. Stage three or stage four, generally that liver won't get better even if you stop TPN. And then you would need a combined bowel and a liver transplant. Uh, this is the sort of criteria as given by CMS. Um, the objective data, if you have consistent hyperbilirubinemia greater than eight, um, that uh, really means that liver is not going to get better. Any clinical signs of portal hypertension, splenomegaly, collateral vessels or around your abdominal veins, uh, progressive thrombocytopenia, all those secondary markers of portal hypertension, that's a bad sign. That liver probably won't um, uh, tolerate a bowel transplant alone. You would probably need a bowel and a liver transplant. If, we, if you biopsy the liver, if there's stage three or fibrosis, three or four fibrosis, and that really means that you need a combined liver and a bowel transplant. So obviously we'd like to catch patients before they develop liver disease uh, for a number of reasons. One reason is that it's a lot easier to get a bowel transplant, isolated bowel transplant, than it is to get a bowel and a liver transplant. Because now if you need a liver transplant, you got to get in line with everybody else who's got you know cirrhosis from hep C or alcohol or NASH, things like that. So it's much harder. And the mortality on the wait list is a lot higher on patients that need a combined bowel and liver than versus a bowel. Um, other non-intestinal failure indications for bowel transplant. Uh, so again, they're, they're, you're not on TPN, your bowel works fine. Desmoid tumors that are in bad locations at the base of the mesentery where they infiltrate into the uh, foregut. Uh, generally, uh, we would consider a bowel transplant for those patients. Again, this is you know 20 years of, of uh, ago indications that the treatment for desmoid tumors uh, has, has changed. It's uh, gotten better. So this is a little bit of a controversial air, uh, indication uh, for bowel transplant. End stage liver disease with portal mesenteric thrombosis. So if you have liver disease for whatever reason, cirrhosis for alcohol, uh, Hep C or or Nash, uh, but you your portal vein and, and mesenteric vessels are thrombosed. Um, that you can't even do an isolated liver transplant. So here's a normal liver. You can see on the left, normal portal vein. You could transplant this liver, uh, put a transplant in this patient here very easily. You have the portal vein, you have the hepatic artery, things like that. Here on the right, this is a patient that with a gnarly cirrhotic liver, there's no portal vein. Uh, you can't put a, a, a new liver into this patient because there's nowhere to hook up the new portal vein. So if you had diffuse portomesenteric thrombosis, you would need everything taken out uh, and a whole new uh, system put in. And, and based on the anatomy of the blood supply, you would need a stomach, pancreas, intestine, and liver. Even though you don't have pancreas failure, you don't have bowel fa failure, uh, but you are replacing those organs uh, for an anatomic reason. Uh, and that's because you can't do an isolated liver transplant. And we'll talk about more of this, this later, but that's just to give you an idea of one indication for bowel transplant. Um, so, so these are the different types of bowel transplant grafts. You have the isolated bowel, you have the liver bowel, and you have the multivisceral. Uh, and again, these are the indications that I just talked about for why you would need each of these different types of, of grafts. And it's very important that you know um, what type of bowel transplant graft somebody has. So when we say bowel transplant, you have to next ask the question, is it an isolated bowel? Is it a liver bowel? Is it a multivisceral? They're all considered bowel transplants. So you really need to know uh, what type of bowel transplant um, it, it is. And I'll talk about each one of these to kind of hopefully um, uh, make it clear uh, the difference between these different types of, of bowel grafts. Um, first of all, we need to do the donor operation. Um, I know it's lunchtime. And so if you're a little queasy, uh, <laughs> and you're eating your lunch, you may wanna put that aside. But uh, here is a, a donor. Um, again, we opened up from the top of the, uh, of the sternum down to the pubis. We've exposed the heart. There's a laparotomy pad on the, on the heart. You can see the liver, the stomach. Morning. Um, uh, <laughs> and the bowel, <laughs> excuse me. And, and then we do a, a dissection. Uh, this is a baby that we do the dissection all, you know, while the heart's beating, you know, there's blood pressure, they're, they're on the ventilator and we dissect everything out very carefully. So it makes it a lot easier to take the organs out once we flush the body with the preservation solution. So this is the stomach kind of rolled up. You're, at, you're looking at the patient from the patient's left side in. So the pancreas is here. There's a little, this tip of the spleen. Uh, you can see the stomach is rolled up. So we get all the mesenteric um, and uh, abdominal vessels out prior to flushing the organs. 
then we flush the organs and put them in a, a, a Playmate cooler, as you can see uh, right here. We then fly back to Georgetown. Um, it's usually, um, uh, you see pictures of this nice, luxurious uh, Learjet. Here's uh, our fellow Oz, uh, Brian, our attending, new attending, former fellow. Um, they usually fly back in a, in a Learjet that, that they enjoy in the highlight high life, but um, really in reality, this is what it is. It's you're in a cramped, tiny little jet uh, and you're usually doing these at night. So um, that's, the, this, that's the, the reality right here. So the donor operation is done. We bring the organs back and then we start uh, the, the implantation, the recipient. So I'll first talk about the isolated intestine. Remember there's three types, isolated intestine, there's liver bowel, and then there's multivisceral. So Isolated bowel, these are the conditions that lead to short gut syndrome. Um, we get referred to these cases from all over the country because nobody wants to operate on these patients. They're on TPN, they're stuck in the hospital, they have fistulas draining three or four liters of fluid uh, every day. Uh, they can't maintain their nutrition or hydration. Uh, this is a patient uh, with Crohn's disease with multiple fistulas. Uh, this is a uh, a bowel that had suffered from mesenteric ischemia, an acute arterial uh, infarct of the entire small bowel. And this is it after it's taken out. It's clearly a non-viable. Um, here's another picture of a, of a fistula, used, usually something with a surgical misadventure, uh, abscesses, perforations um, from just another, you know, like a colectomy operation or something. Um, again, same thing, usually something with a surgical misadventure. Um, this is a, a child who showed up. This is obviously he's been here for a while. Um, you know, we had to take all this bowel out. Um, it obviously was not working. Intestinal failure ended up transplanting this baby. Uh, and this is another patient with um, fistulizing Crohn's disease. So these are the type of short gut syndrome patients that we get um, that, uh, that we first take out this disease bowel and then uh, consider them for transplant. Uh, this is, these are the functional intestinal failures, the pseudo obstructions. Generally, it's in uh, older kids or young or adults. Um, these are these uh, dilated, dysmodal bowel. These patients are absolutely miserable. Um, they've learned to, to cope, you know, for the majority of their life, you know, until they're teenagers or they're, they're 20 or 30s. And then it, it just, um, they, they end up being on TPN because they just can't keep up. Um, with all the tricks that they use to, to you know, get their nutrition. Um, <clears throat> I've had some kids roll around on the ground. That's how they get um, the, their, their food down to their, their colon. Uh, but these patients are miserable. They, they actually do very well after transplant. It's really life uh, changing for, the, for these recipients. And again, these are the functional intestinal failure patients. Uh, so this is a cartoon drawing of a graft. You can see that it's really simple concept. Here's the bowel. Uh, you have the donor SMA, the blood goes in, the blood comes out, the donor SMV here. Uh, this is a picture of it on the back table. Here's the SMA and here is the SMV and here's the small bowel. Um, this is how we put the bowel into the recipients. Um, first of all, the ground rules here, the, the black and white is the recipient and the color is the transplant. So we, uh, majority of times we hook up the bowel directly to the aorta and vena cava as here, because the majority of patients are short gut. So they don't have mesenteric vessels. The, the, they're all scarred down. The patients that we can hook up the mesenteric vessels, uh, we do, we use that. We use a native SMA and native SMB. Uh, this is more of a minority of cases like that, but this is how we hook up uh, the bowel transplant uh, in, the, in the recipient. Pretty simple concept. You have the blood in and the blood out. You hook up the, the, the bowel uh, to maintain enteral continuity. Uh, here's some pictures. This is that same uh, pseudo obstruction picture. Looking, you're looking at it from the patient's feet up to the head, heads up here. We've isolated the base of the mesentery here. We're going to get out uh, the SMA and SMV. This is looking at it from the side, on the right side down. So the liver is here under your left. And here's the SMV and here's the SMA. And we're going to cut right here we're going to take all this uh, bad bowel to the right out as you can see here this is the the diseased bowel and then we put on some extension grafts this makes it a little bit easier we use some donor grafts from the um, donor blood vessels from from the uh, from the donor uh, and then we sew those on to the native um, uh, sma and smv 
uh, and then we simply um, sew in the, the new valve to the SMA and SMB. Here's the suture line for the SMB and the suture line, can't really see it well from the SMA right here. Um, that's the uh, sent a portal venous drainage. If we need central drainage, this is the majority of cases you can see here, uh, you're looking straight down into the abdomen. Here's the IVC. Um, uh, inferior vena cava, here is the inferior aorta, here's the left renal vein. So we expose these vessels. And in the same principle, we, we just sew on some uh, donor grafts. In this case, it was a carotid artery we use from the donor. Um, and then we uh, simply uh, sew in the bowel grafts, as you can see here. This is be right before reperfusion with bowel, and this is right after. You can see the clear difference after the bowel is reperfused. Uh, this is it at the end. You can see the intact SMA and SMB here. This is the new bowel. And really the bowel starts peristalsing as soon as you reperfuse it. It starts to fill up with fluid, secrete fluid, and it starts moving right in front of your eyes. Uh, we have to hook up the proximal jejunum to the native jejunum here. Um, and then we put in a gastrojejunal tube um, and, uh, and that's, that's the bowel transplant. Colons uh, have been um, used more. We've included the colon in the majority of, of bowels that we do now. Uh, this is a little bit older data up to 2012, but you can see uh, it's been rising over time. The first one was done early, about 20 years ago. And it's shown that the, the incidence of fluid independence is much higher when you transplant the colon. Uh, these patients have better bowel movements or on less anti-motility drugs. And actually the, the graft survival is a lot better, statistically better with a colon than without. Um, we can do that because the blood supply to the colon comes off the SMA, as you can see here in this cartoon, same blood supply. Here's a, uh, an intraoperative uh, back table of the, donor, of the bowel with a colon, again, the SMA and SMB right here. Uh, we always do like a loop ileostomy, so we can biopsy the bowel. We biopsy the bowel twice a week for about four to, four to eight weeks after transplant for, for, to check for rejection. There's no test, there's no blood test. CT scan, whatever that'll tell you if you have a rejection, you have to actually have to take a sample of the bowel and look it under a microscope. And that's the only way you can tell rejection. So instead of doing colonoscopies twice a week, we, we do it through this ileostomy. It's much easier. And we can also measure the fluid output. We can look at the stone and make sure it's healthy. Uh, so it's good to have the loop ileostomy there. And then after about four or five months and everything's going well, uh, no rejection, doing well, we simply take down the stoma. It's a much smaller operation. Um, sew the two ends of the bowel together, plunk it back into the abdomen, and then the patient then poops out their bottom. So that's isolated bowel. A little, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, again, if, you, if your liver disease has progressed from TPN, you now need a liver bowel transplant. And, and, and conceptually, it's really basically a liver transplant like you would do a liver transplant uh, and a bowel transplant like I just described right here. So you, the liver transplant, you got to do the artery, hepatic artery, portal vein, bile duct. In reality, though, the vast majority of patients who need a combined liver bowel transplant are infants and small children. Um, they develop, infants uh, develop uh, liver disease much more quickly than adults. We've had adults on TPN we followed for 20 years and their liver is fine. Uh, kids, sometimes after several weeks, they have end-stage liver disease. So the majority, vast majority, 98% of liver intestine transplants are, are done in pediatrics. And I say that because the, the operation is very different uh, when we talk about a liver bowel transplant in a peds versus an adult. Now in a pediatric donor, we don't wanna have to do an artery, a portal vein, a bile duct, because literally the, the graft is about this big. Um, and it's, it would be uh, just, massive technical complications if you had to do an isolated liver um, um, in a baby that small. So what we do is we, we transplant it end block, the liver and the bowel end block. And oh, by the way, the pancreas is in between. So it's actually a liver pancreas bowel transplant. And what we do is we utilize the anatomy, take advantage of it, and we just transplant the aorta to the aorta and the vena cava to the vena cava. So there's only two blood vessels that we have to hook up. Um, to, tr to transplant all these organs. So uh, it's a way to get around some of the technical difficulties of transplanting a, a very small uh, a liver. Um, so it's actually a liver pancreas bowel transplant. This is the donor graph for a small baby liver uh, uh, bowel donor. Here's the liver here. Here's the pancreas. Here's the duodenum sewn shut. 
Uh, here's the small bowel and the colon. And here's the gallbladder. We take the gallbladder out. So again, this is the, you can see how small the, the organs are. This, that's my hand right there. So now going back to this picture again, the black and white is the native um, organ, right? So the stomach stays in, the pancreas stays in, the spleen stays in. Um, uh, and, and so that blood drainage used to go to the liver that's out. So before we put this end block organ in, we need to do a porta cable shunt. So we need to divert the native portal vein down into the vena cava before we put the, the new set of organs on top of it. Um, but if you notice, so this patient actually has two pancreases at the end of the, the, the case. There's two pancreases, two du C loops of the duodenum. Uh, they're on top of each other. So a little bit harder to understand. Um, here's an example of a case. Uh, this is uh, to orient you. This is the belly button right here. The head's up here and the feet are down here. This is a, a typical cirrhotic cholestatic liver from TPN. Um, we sew on this uh, jump graft here. We use the, the thoracic aorta, the donor. It's a good size match. We sew that to the aorta of the recipient right here. And this is looking up into the, um, from your feet are down here. You're looking up into the, um, the heads up top. Um, and you can see we've taken the liver off the uh, vena cava. We preserved the vena cava. We already have our thoracic uh, graft here um, uh, for off the aorta. Uh, we take the liver out and then we construct our porta cable shunt. So now you're at the right side of the patient looking down into the abdomen and you, we've constructed the porta cable shunt as you can see right here in this cartoon right here. And then we bring the organs up. So now you're at the feet looking up into this uh, baby's abdomen and we're going to slide the end block liver pancreas bowel up into the uh into the abdomen and all we have to do now is the upper suprapatic vena cava anastomosis that's all that's the outflow and then the inflow is just this one anastomosis of the uh, aorta so it really simplifies things we basically sew in two anastomoses uh, and this is it at the end. You're at the right side of the patient looking down into the abdomen. Here's the IVC. Uh, here's the uh, hepatic vein anastomosis, the donor liver. Uh, this is the porta cable shunt right here. This is the aortic graft, and this reperfuses all the organs. So this is a liver intestine, generally, like I said, a PEDS operation. Uh, we sew the jejunum in an endocide fashion uh, to the transplanted uh, jejunum here to create enteral continuity. And this is the final product right here. Um, so again, this is a little bit more difficult to understand. Uh, again, it's a PEDS operation. Uh, these patients, like I said, they have two pancreases at the end of the day here and two C loops of the duodenum. So uh, that's liver intestine, multivisceral transplant, the third type of transplant that we do, a little bit easier to understand because we take everything out. Uh, the stomach is out, pancreas is out, duodenum, liver, small bowel, colon, everything comes out uh, and we put a new set of organs in. This is kind of an example of what, why we would do a multivisceral. This is a, a child with a neuroblastoma resection that went awry. The SMA and SMV were injured. The, the bowel was ischemic. Um, it, a Whipple procedure, the, the head of the pancreas became ischemic. Uh, so they had a Whipple procedure. So obviously short gut. There's no way to drain the bile because the head of the pancreas is gone. So the patient had a had a catheter in their liver, a PTC draining the bile. The liver developed a, a TPN liver disease. And so this is a, a patient that received a multivisceral uh, transplant. This is that same patient that I told you before. Again, there's, this is a normal anatomy here. You can't do an isolated uh, liver transplant in this patient here, uh, even though the bowel works fine uh, because there's no portal vein to hook the new liver into. So. Uh, these are cases uh, that we would do a multivisceral transplant. This is the organs on the back table for an adult multivisceral. Here is the uh, liver, the gallbladder comes out. Uh, here's the stomach pulled up, the pancreas right here, the spleen, the spleen's removed. Uh, this is on the back table, so we're doing dissection and closing things here on the back table. And this is the small bowel here. Uh, this is the bowel uh, for a kid, for a pediatric. You can see the stomach here. Uh, the pancreas is behind there. This is the small bowel and the colon, and of course the liver right here. And you can see how small it is. I mean, it's like, these are my hands right here. And, and this, the whole GI tract will fit in your hands. And I, I have this picture of my wife's cat, uh, Snickers. And so it's about the size of a cat. I mean, it's, it's sitting in, in your hands like this. <laughs> so it's really tiny. 
Um, and, and it's just amazing that the entire GI tract will fit in your hands like that. Um, this is an example of, of, you know, a hostile abdomen. You can't sort out anything. You have to take everything out. There's no planes to find, you know, get between the duodenum and the liver. Everything just has to be taken out. Um, it's a tough operation, uh, requires a lot of blood products, great anesthesia. This is another example of just taking the organs out as fast as you can. You have to have great help uh, to stop bleeding. Um, and again, the organs just come out as fast as they can, a massive blood loss, um, and then you put the new organs in. Here is the uh, a human body with no organs. Uh, you're looking straight down from the um, feet. Uh, here's the right upper quadrant. There's a clamp on the esophagus, a clamp on the uh, hepatic veins, and we've got the aorta exposed down here. So this is the cartoon drawing of what you're seeing here on the left. Uh, so there's nothing here, maybe the kidneys, or you can see that faint outline in the back of the kidneys. The kidneys stay in. Um, we put a little jump graft uh, like we do for the other uh, um, transplants that I spoke about. And then we just bring all the organs up and sew them all in. Uh, we, just like I showed you before, and in the multivisceral, we need to do the, uh, uh, there's a little cuff of stomach on the esophagus, so it's really a gastrogastrosomy. We sew, the, we sew that together. And then that is your finished product right here for a multivisceral transplant. Um, so there's a multivisceral uh, without the liver. It's called a modified multivisceral. And that's really indicated in patients who require their foregut replaced, for example, a motility disorder where the stomach doesn't work and the duodenum is dysmodal and needs to come out. But your liver is uh, uh, normal. So in that case, you would just transplant uh, the, the foregut the mid gut here and the hind gut, and you would leave the liver intact. So the, it's black and white because that's that's native. Uh, so if you notice, you have to preserve the hepatic artery. And if also you notice that the outflow of blood for this entire organ system here is the inflow to the liver, right? Because the portal vein is is the outflow for all the the splanchnic uh, viscera, and that's the inflow uh, to the liver. So it's a little bit uh, tricky. You have to, it's like an upside down, we call it upside down liver transplant, but it's not a liver transplant. So here's a, looking at it from the side, we've preserved the hepatic artery. Um, the liver is beat up, but it's normal uh, histologically. And then we take all this uh, foregut out and then we, um, uh, here's the finished product. Again, the liver looks beat up, but it's, it's histologically okay. Here's the new stomach and the new bowel right here. So that's a called a modified multivisceral. It's a little, it's an infrequent operation. We've only done several of these. Um, so this is a recap of all the bowel transplants, isolated bowel, liver intestine, uh, multivisceral transplant, and the reasons why we do it. The liver's okay, then you have a modified multivisceral. So that, that's the surgical aspect of what I wanted to talk about. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's hard, the surgery is difficult, but in reality, the surgery is the easy part in a bowel transplant. And I think a lot of people are probably shaking their head. Uh, yes, because really uh, the hard part about bowel transplantation is after the surgery. I mean, uh, think about what we're doing. We're transplanting an organ that's filled with stool and bacteria and viruses and who knows what. And we're placing that into another human being um, with the, all the lymph nodes that we're transplanting into the uh, other human being. And we're giving a ton of immunosuppression. A bowel transplant recipient probably receives about three to four times the strength initially of immunosuppression than, for example, a heart transplant or a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. And that's where all the, the complications start. Um, that's where really the, med you know, the medical teams really get involved in our patients because um, after the, the transplant surgery and all the technical things have settled down, you know, there's no technical complications. That's when all the problems and complications and difficulties start. Um, this, is, this is a 70s movie from the 70s. It's classic, right? Sideburns, gritty guy, bandage on his nose. Uh, and this is, this is really how I look at bowel transplant because now the hard part begins after the bowel is in and reperfused and working. Uh, and that's where the medical team uh, comes in to follow and manage all of our, our complications and guide us to, to, to get us through all the complications that we see in, in transplantation. I'll talk briefly about this. I won't go in detail because each complication is probably a lecture in by itself. 
you know, I know Joe's given us many lectures on CMV and bowel transplant, uh, and those are hour long lectures. So this movie kind of sums up the post intestine transplant course. So classic 70s movie. And if you're interested, um, what it is, it's, uh, it's a movie, this is a summary, it's a drama and a little romance too. It's that Jim King is a struggling country singer whose life is falling apart. His partner left him to pursue a solo career. His son is out of control and his ex-wife hates his guts and can't wait to see him fail. Life on the road is no fairy tale. That's the, the gist of this movie. And that's how I kind of look at bowel transplant, post bowel transplant. So these are the complications that we see, that you, you guys see with us. Um, acute cellular rejection, chronic rejection, donor specific antibodies, positive cross matches. These are things that, that we deal with um, you know, from an immunosuppression standpoint, but we need help. We need, we need the, the GI service to biopsy these bowels. Uh, we need the blood bank. We need the uh, pharmacy services. We need the pathologist to read the biopsies on weekends and nights and things like that. Uh, so it's a team effort, you know, CMV, EBV, PCP, MRSA, CRE, VRE, and oh, by the way, COVID, you know, these are, you know, when we have uh, Joe Timpone and the Kumar family on speed dial, uh, you guys, you know, you guys deal with this stuff for us and guide us through this. Um, it's, it's really amazing how um, trans, bowel transplant in particular, the, the meld between medicine and surgery is so close. Uh, PTLD, we're, you know, we're calling our oncology service, uh, GBHD, HLH. I mean, um, you know, we call Dr. Broom for HUS, TTP, ITP, DIC, all these things. I mean, it's, uh, you, you guys know who you are. I mean, you, you deal with this stuff with us. I mean, uh, we need the uh, nephrology service for plasmapheresis when we have antibody-mediated rejection. Um, we induce acute kidney injury with prograph levels in 25. Um, a lot of our patients, you know, they have uh, renal problems going into transplant. They end up having end-stage renal disease. They need renal uh, nephrology support. You know, we had COVID patients, um, you know, that were in the ICU, the, the pulmonologist. Uh, you know, we had 30 um, of our 200 so living bowel patients, 30 of them had COVID, some really bad. I mean, you, you guys dealt with it. And none of them died of COVID pneumonia. I mean, it's just a testament to the, the incredible intensive care that, that these patients receive uh, from, from the medical teams. It really is a testament to that. So you guys are involved with us um, just as much as we are. I mean, it, and that's really a, another reason I, I really appreciate uh, talking here because you guys uh, really um, assist us and guide us through the, these complications that we see in bowel transplant. I mean, PTLD and GBHD and liver transplant, it's like less than 1%. I mean, you never see that. In bowel transplant, it's like 8%, 7 or 8%. We see it very common, PTLD, um, um, GBHD. I mean, that's, that's something that you never see in other organs, and, and we see very frequently in bowel transplantation. So, uh, again, if one thing I just want to do is thank all, all you out there that, that help us deal with this. Uh, so I won't talk about each one of these or the, 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 the post uh, intestine transplant um, care. Um, I, I really want to talk about um, um, sort of outcomes and, and where we are in bowel transplant uh, uh, in, in the world, as a matter of fact. Um, this is the Inte International Intestinal Transplant Registry. It comes out every two years. I don't think it came out 2001 or 2021 because of COVID, but this is the last one I have is 2019. And at that time we had, and this is an international experience. So this is worldwide, 4,000 bowel transplants for a, a 35 year experience. So 35 years, there's 4,103 bowel transplants in this registry. I mean, that's 35 years. And to put it in perspective, last year, in one year, there was 24,000 kidney transplants in the United States. So this is 35 years and only 4,000 bowel transplants recorded. Uh, so again, you can see the difference in, in, in numbers. Small bowel alone uh, is the most common, followed by small bowel liver, multivisceral less, and modified multivisceral is a pretty rare um, um, procedure. These are the procedures that I just talked about, so you should know about. Uh, what, what we're dealing with here. And about, uh, just, just for information, about half of these patients are still alive. So uh, that's a statistic that I think is important. Um, this is uh, uh, 
the worldwide experience by region. This is us. This is Asia, Australia here, Latin America, Europe's experience, and North America, essentially the United States. And you can see that the United States does the most bowel transplants in the world. Within each region, you can see though, the numbers have gone down. Each color is a different era. You can see here, this is like a nine year period. This is uh, like a four year period, a five year period here. So um, again, you can see the numbers are going down with each region. But uh, what I wanna just show from this is that the United States does the most bowel transplants in the, in the world um, for, for a number of reasons. But uh, this is, this is um, the worldwide experience. Um, this is the actual data from the U.S. experience for about 20 years, uh, and for several years, um, adults uh, were not done as much as kids. Kids were the majority of, of bowel transplants done uh, in the United States. It hit a peak 2007 of 111 uh, pediatric intestine transplants, and as you can see uh, in the last decade or, or so, the number of pediatric bowel transplants has gone down significantly. Uh, probably due to the better care of these kids uh, as neonates, better TPN management. You don't see the blown out liver from TPN in a baby anymore like we used to. Um, so, so pediatric numbers have gone down. Uh, there was only 34 pediatric bowel transplants in the entire country in 2020. And for adults, it's sort of reversed. Now we do more adults um, than we do kids. As you can see, the red line is adults. In 2020, there were 57 bowel transplants in the entire United States. Um, uh, uh, so you can see the numbers have sort of flipped for peds and adults and have overall gone down. And again, I think it's just, there's better care. There's better care, there's hormonal therapy, um, there's better uh, TPN management. Uh, so there's less need for bowel transplantation. These are the centers that do bowel transplant in the United States. Not very many, uh, UCLA does a few. Um, this is uh, Nebraska, uh, Indiana, uh, Pittsburgh and New York, those are less than 10 a year uh, centers. Uh, the three centers that do the most bowel transplants are us in DC, Cleveland Clinic, and uh, University of Miami in Florida. Uh, and, and last year we did the most bowel transplants in the country of these three. So um, not very many centers do bowel transplants. So, you know, little old Georgetown here, we, we do the most bowel transplants in the country or the world for that, for that matter. This is uh, the actual data in the United States per center. You can see the centers down here in the last uh, dozen years, uh, 12 years. Um, you can see the volume. We, we've done the most bowel transplants in the United States in the last uh, 12 years. I mean, that, that's, this is the, the data right here, uh, followed by Miami, Indiana, Nebraska, and then further behind Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and, and Sinai. So you can see the numbers aren't, aren't large. I mean, it's not like, you know, we do 200, you know, kidney transplants in a week, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's still, um, um, you know, we do the most. So there you go. Um, the outcomes. Let's talk about outcomes of bowel transplant. Um, I'll talk about our program outcomes. Uh, our total experience from 2003, we've done 326 bowel transplants. Uh, again, you can see we've done retransplants, so 314 patients, and we're split pretty much down the middle, which is a little unusual. A lot of other, other centers either do adults or either do all kids, uh, but we do really right down the middle, 157 pediatric bowel transplants, 169 adults. Our, our pediatrics, our smallest kid was three months old, uh, weighing four kilos, uh, and these are, so these are real pediatrics, I and mean, these are tiny babies. Um, our adults, our oldest adult was 66 years, uh, and that, that he's pushing 70 now, so he's doing really well. But so you can see it, it uh, we have a great uh, wide uh, a variety of, of patients, uh, you know, from very tiny to, to very large. But this is our total numbers, 326 bowel transplants. These are the, the conditions that uh, for pediatrics that lead to, um, that led to a bowel transplant. You can see the usual gastroschisis, neck, malrotation, atresia, these are the usual um, pediatric uh, conditions that lead to intestinal failure, uh, motility disorders, you can see here. But, the, but half of them are essentially the, the, the regular uh, kid problems that they get. Um, for adults, very, very, very different. Uh, motility and intestinal ischemia, or mesenteric ischemia make up about a third of the reasons um, we do bowel transplants in adults. 
um, surgical misadventures, um, you know, fistulas, abscesses from other routine procedures that uh, cannot be fixed. Um, we see a lot of those. Uh, Crohn's disease is, is also a, a more and more every, every year. Um, uh, end stage intestinal failure uh, from just bad Crohn's disease. These are really probably the most difficult patients to transplant. They've had multiple surgeries or been on immunosuppression for their entire life. Uh, these are tough. Uh, any mature program, you have a really a decent amount of, of retransplants. Uh, we've done tumors, desmoid tumors, um, trauma where you lose all your bowel, radiation enteritis, uh, portomesenteric thrombosis, that's one of the multivisceral that I alluded to earlier, and, uh, and some mucosal and volvuluses and for adults. So that's the adult, very different from, from the kids. Uh, these are the types of graphs that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is pediatric uh, numbers here in this row here, adults in this row here. For isolated bowels, uh, the first thing I talked about, it's, uh, we do more, much more adult uh, isolated bowels than we do kids. As you can see from these numbers, 134 versus 63. The liver bowel, like I said, is essentially a pediatric operation. Um, overwhelming majority is done in, in kids, 75 uh, versus only two liver bowels in adults. And those were actually non composite. So we did a liver transplant like a liver transplant and a bowel transplant like a bowel transplant. Uh, so you can see very different numbers here. Multiviscerals are really split between equally between the kids and adults. And the modified multiviscerals is essentially an adult operation. We've only done eight of those in our entire experience. So pretty rare procedure. Um, this is just some perioperative operative data. Um, we use a lot of blood in some of these multivisceral cases. 120 units is our largest, 112 for a kid. I mean, you know, this is a Dr. Gilstad that is down in the OR, calling, you know, Baltimore, Red Cross, trying to get us blood. Um, you know, this is, again, uh, the close collaboration from the medical services and, and, and our service here. Uh, the operative time is about seven hours. Our longest was 17 hours, which is a multivisceral transplant. Length of stay, I mean, it's long. I mean, the average is, you know, 44 days. I mean, pediatrics is about two months and adults is a little over a month. I mean, these patients, uh, you know, from all the complications that I showed you earlier, the, that's what keeps them in the hospital uh, for extended periods of time. So, so yeah, it, it's long. I mean, that's why, you know, everyone knows these patients because they're, they're in the hospital. The readmission rate is extremely high. We get them off TPN pretty quickly, and it, for peds, it's about a month. They're off TPN for adults, it's about three weeks. This is just some some data I want to share with you here. This is our overall survival from our entire uh, center experience uh, for about uh, 19 years, uh, and this is pretty good. I mean, this is uh, you know this is comparable to other solid organs. A one year survival of 85 percent and graft survival of 82 percent. You can see here. Um, and at 10 years, it's 62 uh, patient survival. So that, you know, that's pretty good, you know, because the survival of somebody who needs a liver bowel transplant is, is measured in, in months. Um, so, um, so again, these are, these are uh, good results um, that, again, is, is attributed a lot to the, to the majority of the medical folks taking care of our patients. Uh, what I did here was I kind of just split our experience in half you know, arbitrary, you know, separate 50% one, 50% the other. And, and, you know, like anything else, you get better as you go along. In our second era, uh, our survival is over 90% and our five-year survival is 72%. Significantly different from the first half, um, as you can see from this p-value here, not the five-year, it's close, uh, but you can see that the, the separation here. So we've gotten better over time, even though, you know, the era one is not bad and we've gotten better in the second half of our experience. This is the survival by graft type. You can see the multiviscerals um, are is is where the it, you know in a way you know drags down the survival. But you know you know multiviscerals they start out you know uh, ten percent down. There's the ten percent mortality. You, you guys don't even see these patients because they don't even make it out of the operating room. They you know they essentially you know unfortunately die on the operating table. Um, you can see the uh, the, the high upfront mortality for multiviscerals is pretty significant. You know, after you get out, you know, after you get out a few months, uh, it tends, things tend to, to ease out. But you can see we have excellent survival um, 
uh, in the second era for liver valves, isolated valves, and modified multis. And again, modified multis, the numbers are really low. So only like one death would really cut that in half. But you can see, you know, the, the point of this is the, the multivisceles are, have a high upfront mortality. Um, this is what I call a report card. You know, this comes out every six months. This is the last one in January 6, 2022. Uh, this compares our center to other centers in the country. This is public, you know, information. Uh, you can see our, our DCGU is our center here. We're the highest volume, and we have uh, an excellent hazard ratio, less than one. So excellent survival. You can see it's better if it's less than one hazard ratio. This for pediatrics. And for adults here, this compares us to other centers in the country. And so we do uh, extremely high volume and, um, and high quality uh, bowel transplant outcomes. So in summary, you know the indications we talked about for bowel transplant. You know the different types of graphs that we use for bowel transplants and the reason why we use multi-organ transplants. Um, we've improved uh, from way back from the end of life the procedure to now routine operation with survival rates uh, as compared to a liver transplant. Um, our outcomes and volumes here at little old Georgetown, uh, we consistently lead the US intestinal transplant experience. We're the largest center in the country or the world in that matter with the, with the best outcomes. And really it's a, it's a testament to the close collaboration of the medical teams to help us through and guide us through all these complications that we see um, that, that you know, I really appreciate. So I really appreciate being able to, to talk today and, and in a way thank everybody for helping us um, uh, manage these very, very difficult, difficult patients.